Lucas, uh, every time, it, 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 repeating every time, the initial, the audio is some, somehow is a, got some issues. Maybe you, I'm welcome, welcoming to you. We can start again. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, now I'm hearing and uh, the listeners and viewers just be talking about uh, already we are in process to apply the 485. We are in process, we are uh, collecting the all documents uh, and uh, we are filling the questionnaire. Just talk a uh, little bit talking about the 485 process and uh, uh, downgraded EB2, EB3 and forms. L later, the USCS released the new update uh, on yesterday about the H1 process, uh, uh, LCA form and uh, approved, approved, approved uh, limitations. The way we can uh, discuss the end of the show. So first uh, we can discuss about um, uh, EB, EB2, EB3 downgrade. The Lucas, you can share. We, we know that right? we discussed a lot last three weeks. We are discussing about the downgrade, downgrade uh, EB2, EB3. So again, I'm I'm uh, asking you the for fast two weeks or maybe you started to file in the process. Did you get any calls or did you hear any questions on uh, downgradable from the H1B holders? Maybe you can share uh, on last couple of weeks a uh, trend of uh, EB2, EB3 downgradable. Sure. Uh, so, you know, referencing the past couple of weeks, how we've discussed uh, the options that one has whenever it comes to filing uh, you know, adjustment of status to make sure we have the filing date current, um, you know, with whatever visa category uh, there might be. So what we want to, you know, take advantage of is sometimes you can downgrade from EB2 to EB3. So right now, you know, uh, looking at the filing dates, we can see that EB3 has moved significantly further than EB2. So it gives a lot of people uh, an option to downgrade. Now, when you downgrade, you're going to need your uh, employer who filed the I-140, who has that approved, to go ahead and refile uh, another I-140 seeking to uh, the category of EB-3. And when we do this, we won't be able to file in premium, but we can go ahead and file uh, concurrently with the adjustment of status application. And this would, uh, you know, jumpstart the process for EAD, advanced parole, and, um, you know, later on down the line, you might be able to, if you choose to, you could upgrade uh, to premium once receipt's been issued for your I-140. But uh, initially, you're not allowed, you're not permitted to file in premium because uh, you have to request a copy of the certified ETA 9089 or the PERM to be sent back for adjudication with the I-140. So there are a lot of options. Uh, and, you know, again, when we say concurrent, we're filing... Uh, you know, adjustment of status and uh, advanced parole, employment authorization, all at the same time. Yes. Yes, Lucas. Um, so now everyone uh, got the more information about the EB2 down, EB2 downgraded to EB3. Maybe you can ask the question when we when we open the conference call. You can ask your scenarios to the uh, Lucas uh, before open the conference call. Just we would like to discuss uh, about the forms. The what are the forms involved this uh, 485, 485 process uh, without the uh, downgradable? The with the downgradable. Lucas, can you uh, give a little bit more on these forms? Then we can discuss each and every form and uh, we can uh, maybe we can clarify some of questions from each form. Can you give sure. a little bit more about this, the forms? Sure. So uh, when we file the forms, there's going to be a, a few forms required when we file for adjustment of status. Primarily, it's going to be the I-485. Uh, that's going to be your your primary application to start the process. Uh, if you are an EB2 right now and you have an I-140 with the either final action date or filing date that's current, uh, you can go ahead and file your uh, adjustment, and you're going to need a, a I-45 Supplement J. Now, the Supplement J is going to allow you to take an I-140 that was approved 
prior to 2011 um, or with a priority date prior to that, depending on who your employer is now. And basically, it's going to say that you're still, uh, the job offer for the future position is still offered uh, on the table and that, you know, your employer still wants to employ you in that role. Uh, Moving on from that, you would also want to file your I-765, which is your employment authorization form. Um, most people are familiar with this because you are required to file this for H-4 EAD, or uh, if you're an OPT, if you had an OPT in the past, or STEM OPT, uh, this would allow you to have employment authorization. Uh, then you would also want to file your I-131, which would be your advanced parole document. Uh, now, on most of these forms, there's additional fields and additional questions that arise determining, d determined by the classification you're seeking. So for the advanced parole form, for example, you know, probably two-thirds of the form is going to remain blank because it wouldn't apply to uh, the person applying for advanced parole. So you have people who apply for travel documents who might have something based upon asylum or other some other category. Uh, similarly, you would have the same thing with I-765, where that form is used for you know over 30 different categories uh, for employment authorization. So some of these require a CVS ID number. For H-4 EAD, uh, this would require the principal immigrant's uh, most recent approval notice. Uh, so when you fill this out for adjustment status, most of these fields aren't required. So it is going to look a little odd when you are processing your forms because there are going to be quite a few blank spots or blank fields, but that's okay. Yeah, but we want to make sure we complete everything that is required. Uh, and then finally, uh, we also need to complete the I-944 form. Uh, this is going to be the new public charge form that's required on all the filings. Um, and, you know, you'll include your household members, you'll include uh, a credit score, you'll include, you know, what you've made in the in this past year on your W-2s or your tax filings, and you'll also include all your assets and all your liabilities. And on the forms, there's a way to list everything, document it, Mark. and then uh, it'll calculate the numbers so it'll help add up everything for you. Um, and, and then finally... The only other form that there would be is if you're downgrading, you would file, obviously, the I-140 at the same time. And the I-140, if you downgrade, um, you file everything else concurrently. <coughs> but for the 485, you would not have to file the Supplement J because you're filing a fresh I-140 at the same time as the adjustment application. So, therefore, it's not required at that time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos, for the very detailed forms. The first uh, we come to 485 form. So it means uh, we have a lot of information we need to fill in uh, 485. In this, uh, in 485, there is a section for the parents. Parents and uh, with, uh, their date of birth, the place of birth, where currently, where they are staying. Is it required to uh, primary, primary applicant or uh, and the dependent applicant to fill this Portion. Yes, it's required for both. Uh, so each applicant is going to have their um, own application pending. So uh, if a husband who's a primary applicant with I-140 um, is going to have, you know, his parents, his mom and dad listed, and then if he has his spouse who's a derivative, she'll still have her own application that's independent from him. So she'll need to list her parents as well. If they both have children, you'll need to, you know, list your children accordingly. And uh, also, maybe if uh, someone has a child from a prior marriage, you would need to list, you know, even if it's a stepdaughter, stepchild, stepson, whatever it might be, you need to list them as well. Uh, even if they're U.S. citizens or whatever the circumstance might be, you need to list uh, all biological uh, parents and children. Okay. So you mentioned this, uh, let's say in, in a family, maybe the kid is born in United States. They are U United States citizens. Do we need to disclose the 
the kid who born here in 485 yes you'll need to disclose the child on the application that that's your biological child now obviously you're not going to be submitting an an application on behalf of the child because they're already a US citizen so we still need all that biographical that biographic information included in the form so that everything's well documented in the future this is also going to require you know marriage license uh, birth certificates uh, you know for each person involved now if you're filing with your wife um, it's a good idea i was in general practice i was file each person's uh, birth certificate including the kids in their own packet and then uh, obviously each i'd have two copies of the marriage license one going with uh, husband one going with wife and treat them as both individual uh, applications while they're being mailed out. But uh, for, you know, each form you can use, uh, you know, if you file the taxes and, and include that based upon the I-944, you wouldn't also have to repeat that again for, uh, you know, any other form like 485 or anything else. So um, it's important to know when we're thinking applications, each applicant's going to require their own uh, forms and, um uh, supporting evidence to be included. So it's a good rule of thumb. You treat each one independently and then file. you can file them all together, but we need to make sure they're all uh, more or less bound and independently grouped uh, when they go for the processing. Okay, good. Uh, Lucas, here I, ha I have the additional question on this, the U.S. citizen kid. Let's say we... We are we we are disclosing to the biological information within the family. So, do we need to submit the the U.S. Uh, U.S. citizen kid the birth certificate? Is it required to submit, or just we need to mention about the kid who born in the United States? You you need to submit the birth certificate uh, whenever you're filing. Especially, you know, um, just so all the information is complete uh, and, and together. So um, in other cases, so in other categories, let's say um, you're married and uh, you have a child or something like this and a husband's petitioning for his wife, you know, it's something that, that's used to see the whole picture of uh, how, you know, to make sure the relationship's a bona fide relationship uh, also, if you have a kid here that's uh, a citizen, likewise, and your spouse is uh, going to be a derivative on your application, it's always good to show that, hey, there's a bona fide relationship here of uh, a bona fide marriage. So there's no, uh, uh, I guess, uh, doubt to that. No. Okay. So uh, just adding another note. So I hear some misconception about the birth certificate and if a bit, let's say, uh, who born in maybe, maybe before 1985 or something. So at the time, the in Indian system doesn't have the proper, the birth, the certifications system. So later they, they uh, took maybe later 2010, 13, maybe after whenever get a chance. Let's say we, if uh, let's say if anyone took the birth certificate uh, before ninety. So here I hear some misconception. Even we took the birth certificate in before nine, 1990. Now we need to do some additional affidavit on already have the birth certificate. Is it really? Or can you give the, your pros? Um, no point of view on this birth certificate and you can clarify on this one. So what you're referring to obviously is pretty common. Uh, you know, we have three or four major cycles in the past 100 years or categories for, you know, India. You have, you know, pre-47, pre-85, so on and so forth. Obviously, if you're, if you're from uh, AP, there's the state was bifurcated, you know, sometime back. So there's issues where you have you might have once been in Andhra and now you're in Telangana. Uh, so the records might not match. Uh, if you have a valid birth certificate that was uh, issued by the government, then that's perfectly legitimate and fine to use. Now, you don't need to have additional affidavits or anything else. Where the affidavits come into play is if a document 
and, and the Department of State is who re regulates this. So I'm speaking primarily for Indians at this point. So each country might have its own rules as far as like if a document is not available, some other document can be used. So our Department of State has said that if a if you get a notification that a birth certificate is not available or can't be issued, you can get have a, two affidavits uh, issued uh, for people who were there who knew around the time you were born, uh, you know, to testify to that effect. Also, you can use your provisionals as a supplemental document. But as far as like having a birth certificate and then requiring additional documentation, that's not necessary. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, recently I hear maybe the my friends are discussing about that. He had the birth certificate even though maybe someone is requested to do some effort a bit on, ex on birth certificate. So just nowadays is uh, the information is uh, flowing one person to another person. So most of uh, most of the people is got confused which one is correct or which one is not good, not correct. So yeah, that is a good information, Lucas, to clarify on birth certificate. Let me so, add, let me add one more point that you brought up, and if I don't mean to interrupt you, but one one additional point when you have information from other people, uh, I know a lot of people say that you know I feel better sending my medicals right now, uh, and things like this. You know, it's not necessary. You know, it's completely permissible to wait to send medicals later. And the reason I'll tell you why is if you have a, a filing date and you're filing EB3, unless your priority date might be 2014, May, okay, your final action date is not going to happen anytime soon. So if you can imagine when your final action date becomes current, or if you go back to EB2 in a few years, um, your taxes are going to be different. Obviously, you're going to need a fresh medical there might be other documents required at that time, just like this year, Donald Trump's required us to provide more information as far as public charge rule. Maybe that public charge rule's not available or applicable in the future, right? So the, what we're doing right now is we're making sure we have a complete package to submit. Now, not, there's not going to be any action taken on this package other than uh, – opening the file and, and allowing you to file for uh, employment authorization and advanced parole. It's not like an officer is going to go ahead and start working on your adjustment, but, you know, based upon the current situation uh, because they can't because the final action date is not current. So when a final action date becomes current, they'll issue an RFE or some other letter or notice to let you know, hey, we're, this, we're missing this information. Please send it in within this required time. Okay, yeah, that is a good information, Lucas. Yeah, so uh, Lucas, I have um, the, some questions in um, the public charge, the form I-944. So in this form, in a family, the both the husband and wife is working, so we need to disclose both the uh, income, was husband and wife. So do we need to enter individual income or we can combine as uh, as for tax fi files and uh, enter the the amount what yearly and for both for for both the uh, salaries so you would want to file joint income if you file joint taxes so uh, it's going to say what is listed as a wage and everything if if, if you file jointly both items are you know, combined. So it's perfectly fine to go ahead and, you know, list that. Obviously, you're going to have to list, submit the taxes with those documents. Just like if you say I have a, a savings account with X number of dollars, you're going to need to have a record of that to submit. Now, um, a lot of other attorneys, immigration attorneys, have s speculated that, you know, if your case, obviously, it's not going to be adjudicated at this time. All the officers are looking for, if you're using a filing date to file is to see if everything's complete. If the petition itself, I'm sorry, the application itself is complete to go ahead and accept, which means no one's going to look and see if you're going to be a public charge at this moment in time, because there, there's no adjudication on the um, adjustment status. So 
if you have to wait two years, well, you're going to have to update that information, just like what we said before. There's going to be, you're going to have to update your taxes, you're going to have to update your medicals. There, there's work to be done in the future, because if evidence is two years old, a lot of things can change in, re, in, in regards to if you're employed, if you're still married, if, you know, there's a lot of things can happen uh, that, that would have a huge impact on your application. Yeah. So, Lucas, I'm adding uh, this one more point to this. Let's say it's a, in a household, uh, husband and wife. The wife worked before, maybe uh, a couple of years ago, but she she she's not working current. So, can it means uh, which we are we are asking to, we are asking to the everyone to submit the last three years of W two W two. So, which year we need to fill in I-944 form? Is the latest current uh, W-2 or we can take from the 2008 or 2007? Can you give a little more on this one? Yes. So, the document requires you uh, supply, supply the, the most, most recent tax filing from the most recent tax year. So, currently we're in uh, 2020. And obviously, no one is able to file their 2020 taxes. But let's advance maybe four or five months from now, uh, when people start getting W-2s in the spring, and there's a period of time where people might have the most recent tax filing would be 2019. Uh, some people might file early; they might have their 2020s available. So it's really um, the the key word here is the most recent tax filing, and. Um, you know, there's other, if you didn't file in the most recent tax year, there's a place to explain, you know, if you were required to file, if something happened or you weren't required to file, you know, the explanation would be needed. That's why, again, I'm going back to say we want to make sure we have the documents necessary for the case to be accepted. But no one is going to necessarily look at this most recent tax filing based upon your application to adjust status. You know, if you're date becomes current in the next two years, they're going to ask you again for your taxes uh, if this form is still, or the public charge rule is still in effect. Okay. So, Lucas, uh, the same note, um, the most of the H1 holders brought the houses in the United States. So now we need to disclose uh, our real estate property in the United States. Let's say if any H1 holder has the, the house, how could we valuation, it means so how we can uh, evaluate the house? Do we need to uh, enough document from the county or do we need to do the recent, uh, the private agent uh, house valuation document? The, which one is uh, necessary for the applied Very recent? We need to attach the document. Which one is enough for attaching the document? Very good question. So a lot of these uh, questions have arisen here recently, obviously, with the new form. Um, USCIS hasn't necessarily given exactly the best uh, requirements for this new rule. But what has been uh, discussed and is permissible, you can have, obviously, your tax records from the city would show you the current appraised value. Uh, you can go to maybe a, a third-party uh, app like uh, Zillow or Redfin, I think, are two common ones to pull an estimate for your house. You could contact a real estate agent to pull comps and give a, an opinion, or you can go and, and find someone to actually appraise the house. Um, fortunately, uh, this time in American history, Pretty much if you buy a house today, tomorrow it's going to be worth more than what you paid for, which means uh, there's not much chance of you being underwater, which means you owe more than what the house is worth. Uh, the primary use of this new tool is to show that you're able to have liquid asset if you were to be um, in need of any assistance that you can pay for yourself. Uh, one of the factors that's considered is obviously real estate holdings even though it's not like you can just go sell your property tomorrow, but it's, it's more or less a, a tool used as a factor on this new rule to determine if, if you have the ability to uh, take care of yourself. And again, like I said, 
if your final action date is not current, uh, as long as we meet the minimum requirements of the filing uh, when we submit the forms and the case is accepted, there, you know, and when your final action date becomes current, you're going to have to resubmit that. Maybe you sold your house. Maybe hopefully your house is worth more than, you know, today than, you know, when we filled out the forms. So all that's going it, to, it's always in flux. It's just, it's always going to be more information in the future, if that makes sense. It means so the document uh, we can get from the Jile or Redfin or maybe County, the appraisal document. These documents are enough to submit the UCS, right, Lucas? Correct. And again, like I said, it, you know, there's no need to go out and spend a lot of money requesting this information if you're going to have to resubmit this information in a few years. Or maybe, hopefully, uh, the court case that's right now pending has some final decision or maybe a new administration rescinds this requirement in the future. Um, there's a lot of things that could change. And it's just like your medicals. Why? There's no reason for you to spend five or $600 for you and your entire family to have a medical done right now if your priority date is like 2013 and EB3 because you're not going to need those. You're not going to get your GC before those medicals expire. So you're going to have to redo them again in the future. And it's, you know, you're spending double money. Yep. The one question now, Lucas, how many years will it take to get the GC for this example, for 2013 and 2014? You know, I really am optimistic about this next year. I really believe, you know, we've been talking about immigration reform pretty much my entire career. Uh, it hasn't really transpired multiple so times. Yes, Lucas, this is the matter, right? Once we get the EAD, and the next look after for the green card, everyone looking for the green card. So that is the ultimate to get uh, the status to stay in the United States. So the fast couple of years we've seen, uh, maybe a couple of people, uh, most of the people, uh, after get the EAD, they stayed on EAD for three years, four years, and five years mm -hmm. to get the green card. But I don't know the current situation. As you said in before the previous week, we have the numbers, green card numbers. Definitely, it moved forward quickly. So we hope get um, the green card as soon as possible. I hope so. You know, I hope you know, there's something that transpires within the next six months to a year to really help take care of this backlog. Um, you know, if not, if we have to continue uh, down this long, long path, uh, it is a good idea. And, and I know we've discussed this over the past three weeks. Uh, and I just want to bring up, I, I don't want to jump ahead too much before we take questions. But, you know, we have a new final rule that just came out for H-1Bs, okay? The rule uh, is basically increasing the minimum, uh, the prevailing wage and the wage levels uh, it's going to actually take effect uh, tomorrow if you file LCA, and it's going to be, uh, I think, for perms by the 10th. Um, what this means is if you're currently working, let's say, in Dallas, a level two, uh, as a software developer, you're approximately making 94 k a year as a prevailing wage. Now, for level two, they're going to increase that substantially to where now you might be a, a around 115 to 120,000 a year at that wage level and um, obviously margins uh, and wages aren't that high and it's going to it could put a big squeeze on uh, what your career might be so if maybe your current employer uh, says hey we can't pay that you know vendor and clients not paying that that margin that we need uh, we can't proceed with your h1 visa Okay, it's great to have that EAD as a backup plan because then if, if something like that happens, you are you can then just say, okay, I'll keep working on my current margins because there's no requirement on EAD for a prevailing wage or anything like that. So you can go ahead and switch over and it would help preserve whatever career you have and whatever in the client right now. And it takes away a lot of the uh, uh, unpredictability that might come you know, with H1. Okay. 
Yeah, this is the new rule. It's going to be implemented from tomorrow onwards, October 8. So, a little, little bit of uh, worried edge fund holders, we understand. So, just follow the immigration news and uh, take it right direction. So, Lucas, uh, these are the, my common questions. So, the most of the people have these common questions I asked earlier. Now we can open for the conference call and uh, we can take a calls from them and uh, we can clarify the questions. Sounds good. Yeah, first, yeah, first we can take a call from uh, the phone number last four digits is 7582. Maybe you can say your name and you can ask the question. Last four digit, 7582. Okay, maybe he doesn't have any questions. Maybe we can go for Avatala Prasanna. Can you? Hello? Maybe anyone ask the questions? Uh, no, maybe. Yes, you can proceed. Hi, my name is Murli. Hi. Yeah, Murli. Yeah, yeah, Murli. Hello. Yeah. Thank, thank you, actually, both of you for conducting this. Uh, first one, right? It's very helpful. I've seen last video as well. Um, if I have to crisp about my own situation, I was I was talking to my employer, and he told uh, she told me actually, um, I'm an EV2. They asked me if I if I if I have to downgrade, then there is a risk associated with this because. The uh, the university which I accredited in uh, uh, 2012-13 is no more uh, accredited at this time. So there may be a chance that actually when the USCIS uh, pulls the old I-140, they may see this and then they may see any deficiency of the documents and they may deny the case. Even if they approve at this time, there is another chance when uh, they call for an interview at the time also they may review and they may deny so there is a risk associated with it. So they asked me to waive waive in that and then try to you know use my discretion in um, downgrading or not. So I thought uh, maybe it is a good chance to ask. Uh, uh, Mr. That's a good. Garrison. That's a very good. That's a very good question. And I'm glad you're able to uh, follow and like us on this show and participate because it's really uh, adds to the show. The more participants we get to discuss these uh, scenarios. Um, in, in your situation, if you're downgrading, um, you know, what, what is your bachelor's in? Are you a B-Tech? Did you have civil engineering, mechanical? What, what was your background back in India? No, uh, I have been, India? No, no, in India, I have been a B-Com and also um, a master's in financial management that is actually, uh, you know, it's incomplete with the thesis. Right. So, what well, you could have since you have a Bachelor of Commerce, and I'm sure your uh, labor was focused on, on those uh, degrees or the options or, or alternatives for something similar to that. Um, since you're filing EB3, uh, you could wholly focus on the um, foreign degree, right? So there's no requirement for the masters or anything else because you you would have that qualification for EB three for what you have back home, correct? Yes. Yeah, plus of work experience, both actually in both ways, I should have been qualified. But I was told that there, it could put a, um, I mean, there really, there, there's a there's a chance that they may look into all of this and then um, may cause issues. There to my there is a, a at least yeah yeah, yeah there, there's always a chance for that and before yeah. i gave give you any 100 percent advice over anything i mean that's something more we'd have to look at and discuss and i'm assuming you went to like mpu or silicon valley or something like that is that right no i did it in from virginia unfortunately the university actually uh, back and forth their accreditation was actually pulled out mm. and pulled in again Right. So I couldn't help that situation. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 
Well, um, you know, that's something, you know, to discuss more in detail with more of the facts at hand, maybe to review the documents. But um, if your priority date is, it, well, what is your priority date before I proceed? It's September 2014. Um, you know, given that, you if you filed that now, there's a good chance you might have, under the current system, you'll be on EAD for quite a while. Um, just yeah. based on the number of people ahead of you. Now, again, like I said, there's a lot of things yeah. to weigh in, in, on your decisions. So what could these decisions be? Well, you know, uh, do I have family here? Um, do I need to have the security of having H4, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, GCE AD and advanced parole? Uh, what's going to change with H1Bs with this new rule, these new requirements? You know, these are all factors that you have to weigh uh, and decide for yourself to make the best decision for you and your family. Um, to tell you any more specifically, I would probably have to know more information and review some, uh, that information with you. But uh, overall, I mean, I, I would definitely explore filing just, just as to have something as a backup plan, a placeholder, um, because we don't know what might happen, correct? Yeah, yeah, sure. So it won't affect the, for example, if they if they say if they deny this AB3, then it won't affect my AB2 category, right? Just in case, if we later when it becomes currency, for example. Correct. It shouldn't uh, impact that at all. And if your I140 was already approved EB2, uh, based upon that labor, um, really the the only factor. I mean, there there's obviously other things that can go wrong. The main factor. Uh, it, everyone's going to look at is the ability to pay. So if you have, uh, if you're still working for the employer, obviously you're probably being paid more than what the prevailing wage is, you know, yeah. as long as you can document that. Yeah. I, I mean, as far as your education goes, going EB3, I don't think there's much of a risk. But again, I don't want to give you false okay. information without knowing everything, okay? Sure. One more associated thing here is actually they, my employer told me there are two ways to file this. One is an amendment. The other one is this fresh filing kind of a thing situation. So US, uh, usually the recommendation actually is to go for a fresh fi uh, amendment than a fresh filing. And if we go with fresh filing, um, then, uh, sorry, amendment, then there is no chance of going back to uh, EB2. So I'm what, not sure how you, much it is. I mean, um, if you want to talk about it. What do you mean when you say file amendment? So if we go for an amendment, then uh, they will consider um, say permanently I should be marrying to EB3. I can't so so your, what you're doing is you're, is you're downgrading. You're filing a fresh petition. Yeah. Your employer is filing a fresh petition. It is independent of what was decided previous. Now, the only thing that's attaching between the two is going to be the, the labor itself. So... Once you downgrade, you'll be in the EB3 category, and if the EB2 final action date moves up to 2014, then you can upgrade again, right, if the final action date on EB3 is much further behind. So you have the ability. I, I don't think there's so much doom and gloom about um, the issues coming up. The only problem I would say is, like, for the EB2 itself, and that's where I would need more information is, you know, obviously, if your school's not accredited any longer and, you know, the foreign degree doesn't match up to master's, that's something we would have to look, sit down and look at to, to see what qualifications are there or, or are not there, okay? Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the information. Thanks for the call. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Morgan. <laughs> Thank you for your call. So, next, next week, I'll go for initiative. The last four is at five six two five. Maybe you can ask your question if you have. Maybe anyone go for anyone ask the question. Hey, hi. Hello. Hi. Yes. Say say your name. Hello. So. Oh, my name is Suman. Suman, yeah. Go ahead, Suman. Yeah, thanks for answering all the questions and being clear. 
So I have a question, like uh, maybe it's a repetition, but uh, once the 485 is approved, uh, how long would it take for the green card situation to be there, like uh, like a year or more than that? I mean, given so, the number of visas that we have right now. That, see, that's a good question. That's a very good question because there's a lot of misinformation or you, you're, the thought process is how I'm filing my adjustment of status, correct? Uh, your adjustment of status yeah. is not going to be adjudicated or no one's going to work on that until the final action date is available. Once the final action date is available, you'll have to go in, they'll schedule an interview. Um, they might request supplemental information obviously because you know you might need to show that you're still working for that employer you might have to bring another supplement j new taxes new medical uh and typically after the interview you will go ahead and and sign everything that everything's true and correct in front of the officer on the 485 form and typically at the interview the officer will tell you uh well everything's here they, they'll say one of two things uh, i have to have my supervisor review this and sign off or some of the supervisors will say, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set this aside for approval. You'll get a letter in the mail in the next one or two weeks. And once you get the letter in the mail, it'll say, you know, congratulations, welcome to the United States of America. And then soon after, your green card will follow. Okay? But that, but that's not... But yeah, so it's not like H1 where we're filing a, a petition right now, and then in two weeks you get it approved, and then I'm just waiting for the green card to be available. That's not how it, it would work, Okay. Oh, okay, so you're saying it would take a good sweet time then, or uh, maybe at least a year then. It, well, what's your priority date? Oh, it's in 2012, March. March 2012 in EB2. So right now, you know, we're mm -hmm. looking at, at two plus years from final action date, which means at the current rate, I mean, you're still uh, many, many years out, five or six years probably uh, at the current trends. Um, and then, of course, if you downgrade to EB3, um, it, it would still be about the same since so many other people are probably going to downgrade. Um, so if you can Im imagine this, let's say, for example, I want to file tomorrow. Okay. I file mm -hmm. my application. Yeah, downgrading. And I'm downgrading. I get EAD and mm -hmm. advanced parole after six, seven months. Correct? Once I have that... Okay. My application is still sitting there in a queue, and the queue is waiting until my final action date becomes current. Once my final action date becomes current, my case comes out of the queue, and an officer will start processing my case. If the dates regress or retrogress after an officer take, takes my case out, then they'll move the case back into the queue. So... This is why I'm saying it's good to have your foot in the door because if we have comprehensive immigration reform or if Congress says, hey, there's such a backlog, let's issue 500,000 more visas or 1 million more visas to get rid of backlogs, if your case is already pending, it's just going to process that much faster, okay? Okay, sure. Thank you. You're okay. welcome. Thank you for calling. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, can you go for last four? Is it 7220? Hey, um, hey, hi, Lucas. Uh, this is Naren. Uh, I, have a of questions. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions, but actually I joined a bit late. Uh, I don't know, but somebody else is asked the same question, but uh, don't test it. Um, so my first question is, uh, I, I, I heard that there is a new rule is implementing uh, uh, from October 8th onwards that it's uh, uh, more into uh, the prevailing wages and as well as it's, uh, your salary component to be uh, more than higher, uh, higher. So, and uh, also there is a one more rule that is uh, the, the third party side, like uh, if you're working for an employee vendor or client model, so you cannot be stay more than a year in the, in the client side. So, how does it affect to that uh, the, the current uh, people who are working in the EVC model? Very good question. Very good question. We kind of touched base on that a little bit earlier. Uh, the final rule was finally, you know, published or released yesterday. Uh, for everyone to review, and basically, based upon a lot of the uh, what was said, you know, I have a here it says, you know, for wage level one, it's increasing from the uh, 45th percentile or to the 45th percentile from 17th, uh, wage level two from 34 to 62nd, from wage level three, 50th to 78. So, there's going to be a drastic increase in the prevailing wage. Now, what does this mean for everyone? 
obviously it's you know not good because uh, if your project you're working in only has a budget for X dollars and you need X plus uh, $20 an hour to keep on that project, they might not keep you on the project. Your employer might not you know, find another project for you to work on. And you, eventually you might end up losing your H-1B visa uh, because you're not able to find projects, right? So that's a bad scenario. Another bad scenario would be also for labor certifications uh, for prevailing wages um, where, you know, you're starting the perm process and now instead of, you know, 90K, now your employer has to pay 130K, okay? That, that's going to, you know, really impact employers' ability to pay the prevailing wage uh, for future employment. Um, I can tell you this. I've been discussing this with a lot of people. Um, I'm, I'm a member of American, American Immigration Lawyers, Lawyers Association. Um, there, uh, there's, there's already a call to action gathering uh, possible uh, plaintiffs for a lawsuit. Um, this is going to happen similar to what happened a week ago whenever uh, the new fees were set to be implemented. Um, my an organization I'm a member of partnered with another law firm, uh, and uh, we were able to get uh, an injunction preventing the new rule from taking effect. I'm pretty confident we're going to have the same results with this rule, uh, just for the way that it violated the normal procedures required for rules to be implemented. Um, and again, I think, unfortunately, uh, for political reasons, the president's used this uh, as a resource to get, you know, uh, publicity showing that he's trying to help American jobs or American workers during the pandemic. And all it's going to do is, you know, really um, impact, you know, our, our valuable uh, uh, immigrants who are here under H-1Bs you know, obviously they're fulfilling a skill and a, and a job that not many people can do here. That's why there's such high demand. So uh, hopefully um, the, everything will will follow the same way uh, from the previous rule and, and we'll end up getting notice that there's an injunction that, of course, blocked this from being implemented, okay? Yeah. Um, okay. I think uh, it, it sounds good to me. And I have an, another one. Uh, this is related to that uh, for a filing. filing. Uh, uh, first question is on it is, uh, I just want to know, so how we got moved from EB3 to 2015 is because of uh, uh, closing that uh, embassies, U.S. embassies across the world uh, due to the mm -hmm. pandemic situation. And if that is the case, how long is it going to be continued? Means that means uh, so we got that October bulletin for uh, 2015. Can we expect more uh, dates uh, for the coming months? Uh, and how soon, maybe you know, every month, is the CSA going to release this uh, uh, new date on it? Yes. Very good question. So to break it up in the uh, segments, um, USCIS, or the, the, actually the State Department every month will publish the visa bulletin. And based upon, you know, the usage, demand, or whatever is being processed. So obviously, since the pandemic is still... Uh, and going on right now, the people abroad aren't able to apply for these uh, visas. So it, it limits, significantly limits the usage of the available visas. Now, the how they determine, you know, how far to move the dates is going to reflect, a, I think, a great deal as far as like the, this month, how many people are going to file uh, to USCIS, because that's really the only way people are going to uh, and be able to take advantage of this is if you're physically here in the U.S. Uh, so that, that to answer the first part, um, I can see uh, the date's probably not moving so much uh, the first month, but potentially maybe by the end of the year they might progress further. Uh, but they also have a good chance if there's, because I don't know how many people of all the pending 120,000 EB2s from India, I don't know how many are physically here in the U.S. right now. I don't know how many might have been traveling and got, you know, couldn't get stamped and are now stuck outside. So, you know, we'll have to see how many people file and what the data says. Uh, and, and that's going to take time. It's not going to be done in one month, if that makes sense. It's, it might take one or two months to see the trend. Uh, okay. So, going forward, we can expect that every month they are going to release a bulletin or maybe there is many, many events. 
major schedule on it, like uh, every three, every quarter or something, they're going to publish our. So every month, the Department of State is going to publish the visa bulletin. It's going to come out typically the 18th or 19th or 20th of each month. Once that's established and published, USCIS will then publish their own uh, dates on what dates they're using. Is it the final action date? Is it the, the filing date? Okay. So if we all of a sudden see you know, 20,000 people filing for the month of October for EB2, EB3 from India, just, just one country, uh, the processing demands that that might put on the system, you know, in, in November, USCIS might say they might move to say only final action dates, or um, they might continue with the current dates for filing from the Department of State. So it just really depends on how many people are here, how many people file. And that's why I recommend everyone is not to just wait and see. Obviously, you'll be able to see mid-month what November is going to you know, bring. But I would go ahead and, and strongly urge people to go ahead and uh, prepare to file in October as if the date is going to change and move backwards. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, okay. Narada. Yeah. Thanks, Narada. So, I think this information is very useful to upcoming visa bulletins. So, the both of uh, H1, H1B new rules and uh, the upcoming visa bulletin. This is very useful to everyone. So now we can go for last four. Is it zero four one zero three seven eight? Maybe you can go for question. So, yes, go for it. Hi, can you listen? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I had a quick question. Uh, when I was submitting the forms for 485, uh, there is a summary of status where I had to submit. Uh, for seven months, I uh, uh, during like 2017, I transferred my H1 to an employer and started working. But mm -hmm. after seven months, it was rejected. So it should be disclosed that petition number. I mean, I, mean, I would show, show that to show that you maintain your non-immigrant status just because, because the petition was ultimately denied doesn't mean you didn't uh, maintain status. So when you file it okay. reporting from one company to another, what's the requirement? Well, the requirement is that your I-94 is not expired, number one. So I'm assuming you transferred and it wasn't expired. Number two, while you have a pending right. receipt, you can work. And you, to show that you maintain status, you would show the payroll, okay? So, ultimately, did you change to another employer after the denial, or did you just refile, or what, what happened at that point? So, after denial, I changed to a different employer, which got approved. Sure. So, um, if there are minor gaps, even if it's something you might not realize, uh, there is waivers available uh, for that up to 180 days of uh, unlawful presence uh -huh. so you know obviously you want to be careful about that i do want to bring up another point you you brought up and this is in no relation to you um there there's mm -hmm. all these questions you have to answer yes no yes no yes no are you a terrorist are you do you support communist party are you a member of a totalitarian regime uh -huh. you know that it, it might seem silly but all those questions are very 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 important okay answering yes okay. or no to those questions doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be rejected or denied. So there's a very important question there. And uh, sometimes, you know, um, it doesn't involve traffic tickets, but it'll ask you, have you ever been arrested or detained? Okay, even if it's something you were not guilty of or nothing else and you think there's no record, you need to be truthful on that. It doesn't mean your case is going to be denied. And I, again, I'm not talking to you. I'm sure everything's fine with you, but I'm just, for everyone out here in the audience, be truthful. Always be truthful. Don't think that they won't know or they don't have an idea about it because they have USCIS is going to have records for everything. And the worst, the, one of the worst mistakes you can make is to put something untruthful on the um, application. Now, sometimes if it's a genuine mistake, an officer will let you change that at the interview, and uh, they'll they'll go ahead and change that for you. But if if the officer thinks that you're trying to to hide that fact or not be truthful about that fact, they could reject your entire application. So, you know, we, we live in a society now, if you get a traffic ticket and something happens and, or police pulls you over, 
and they detain you or, you know, something like that happens, it doesn't mean you're going to be denied. You just need to disclose all that information truthfully. And if there is any issue with that, you need to consult with the immigration attorney to make sure that the evidence is presented in the correct manner to, you know, keep the case from being rejected or denied. A very good question. Okay. Uh, uh, I have okay. one more quick question. Uh, sure. In I-94, uh, I-944, there is a uh, column where we have to fill in the I-140 form. Is it the form which we are going to file with the current employer, or can I carry it over from the previous employer, which I'm going to use the date? Correct. So what you're referring to is the portion of the I-944 form that requires to see what your education level is, what your special skill set might be, you know, and, and if you have an I-140 uh, from, you know, applied on your behalf, that means that you're already, you know, uh, have a high education, and so it's not required. So you can list whatever pending uh, or whatever pr previously approved I-140 is there. That's perfectly fine. Um Obviously, if you're gonna if you're gonna downgrade and file, uh, you know, obviously you'll have the concurrent filing, and and that information will all be there at the same time anyway. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you That's for welcome. call. So we can take a next call. Maybe Chakri. Chakri nine three nine six last four digit. Ah, uh, sure. Thank you. Hey, Lucas. Uh, my Hi. question is basically. My husband is under EB3 um, in 2013 January. I'm an EB2 in 2011 December. Um, so if I, let's say if I file with my husband and just <clears throat> get an EAD, but we don't use it, um, in case my EB2 becomes current, um, I heard that if I'm a derivative applicant and my husband. So I also heard we can um, uh, send a letter and, you know, switch the roles, you know, primary being uh, spouse and spouse being primary. Uh, is it really a practical and possible scenario? Because I also heard in some cases, the CSCS sent the letters RFE stating that, you know, your spouse's uh, alien number is, you know, got caught and, you know, you want to switch. I don't know. I, I just heard <laughs> from friends, uh, you know, maybe it's the blogs. Um, I'm not sure if it is. I never heard from any other one. So that's my question. Yeah, so it's a very good topic, and there's a lot of people who fall in the same category. So, Typically, um, if you're a derivative, um, you know, you would have the same benefit of filing at the same time as the principal applicant and vice versa if your date becomes current. Sometimes you're able to go ahead and switch uh, uh, and upgrade the final action date because, you know, your, your spouse would be also listed under the I-140 if you filed, you know, this, and he was, and you're married. Now, where this might not work is if you filed your I-140 in 2011, and then you get married in 2012. Your spouse isn't technically listed on the I-140 at the time you filed, correct? So, yeah. you know, there's certain circumstances and things like that. But, yes, you can, um, once you get, like, like I said, once you get your application out there and your foot's in the door, there's a lot of things you can do to update the service in the future, to take advantage of filing dates, uh, final action dates, uh, uh, so you can go ahead and get the GC and, and move forward. So, you know, th there, there's been new requirements now with the I-140s uh, where you have to go, and I'm sorry, employment-based immigration where you have to go to interviews. Uh, so in the past, that was plausible. Um, in the future, what's uncertain, I don't know if you would have to refile uh, at that point, depending on what the roles and responsibilities would be uh, as far as like the adjudicator looking at the petition, your employment. So it's really kind of, I would say yes uh, to that, but um, most of the cases where this has come up, you know, interviews aren't necessarily required because they were filed so long ago. Okay. You're right. So the interview rules about three years old now and um, um I've heard both ways, but uh, what you're saying is, is definitely probably more the norm. But it wouldn't surprise me maybe if they say it's not, you know, you need to refile or something like that. That's that's also possible. I'm okay. just based on so much clog is there, but that's why I think probably that. Well, it's just, it's just you. like, uh, you're welcome. It's just like this, you know, we have these new forms, this I-44 uh, 
I nine four four. So it's it's also we know what the instructions say. We know what the requirements are. We know what the purpose is. But I even have the field notes that show like what the adjudicators are supposed to to say or in reviewing these items of what they mean. But how that's done in in, in real world and practice and everything, we don't hundred percent know yet. So um, a lot of things can change, and a lot of things can change moving forward as well. Okay, makes sense. In case okay. if they don't accept in that request, then probably we need to void that application. File 485 is uh, not primary being me and my husband being a derivative in that case. So Correct, correct. That would be the worst case scenario, okay. but, I mean, it, it, at that stage, um, you know, just, again, just getting to the finish line would be the main benefit. Right, right, thank you. Okay. It feels like sometimes you have so many options, you don't know what to choose for, right? So. <laughs> Correct. That's not long. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we can go for Rajesh, uh, 0484. Uh, uh, Rajesh, maybe. Uh, uh, yes. Hi. Go for it. Hi. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, uh, my P my EB2 PD is uh, March 2012. So may I have asked uh, some of my I mean one of my uh, consulting yeah. lawyer so, uh, to downgrade um, whether is it right to downgrade or not. Uh, so I just I'm perplexed with the situation that some people are saying to downgrade and some people are saying not to downgrade. So I'm just kind of confused, like in this situation, what what will be my uh, chance of getting GC uh, if at all I do downgrade, or is it the same time that EB2 and EB3 move at the same same uh, pace for for my category? So that's a good question. And, and again, like what I would like to go back to, you you have to analyze your own situation. You have to look at what's going to work best for you and your family. So just because you file adjustment of status right now doesn't mean that you're going to have GC anytime soon, right? So if you're EB2 2012, I mean, that right now, the final action date is 2009, I think September, okay? So it's still quite right. a bit off in the distance, and we don't, I, I don't see those final action dates progressing so much that you're going to have, under the current system, you're going to have GC and EB2 uh, anytime in the next two or three years. It's, it's still going to be many years. So what are what's the okay. advantage? Okay. So what's the advantage? Advantage would be, hey, let me go ahead and downgrade to EB three. I have an adjustment of status in place. I have EAD and advanced parole. So I know it's nothing's going to happen for three or four years, but I have the security of having uh, EAD and advanced parole. Now let's just say, touch wood, something very good happens, and and the law changes or more visas are allocated. Well, if something like that happens, you, you, you could just stay in EB3 because if they address the backlog, if they be in Congress, if they address the backlog, it's going to move everyone quickly. Even people up to 2018, 19, 20. I mean, it, it's going to move very right. fast. So what's the so disadvantage what the of filing? Uh, below of the year? Um, does it cover like um, uh, any any uh, good amount of uh, dates that it can cover for the EB2? Because I, I um, my 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 question is like since it's not, uh, the spillover doesn't carry the category wise uh, denomination of of the giving of the green cards, so uh, that could be a first come first serve based on the spillover, right? So uh, whether it's EB2 or EB3. So uh, in that scenario, even though EB3 has an uh, advanced filing date, um, does the EB2 filing date also move accordingly? It'll move a little, but there's so many people right now similar to you that are going to be downgrading, okay? It's, it, if you have 10,000 people downgrading right now, obviously the date for EB3 is not going to go to you know, June 2015. It's going to go backwards. Right, because so many people are filing. Right. It, it's so. The key is if you want to take advantage of the of the filing in, in the system to get EAD and advanced parole as a backup, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen. Like what we already said about the H ones and this new rule, right? Do you want to have a backup in case something happens where things change? Uh, 
and that way you, you don't have to make a decision of going back home or not, right? That's the most important thing right. I can communicate to everyone right now is to say to be prepared because that's <laughs> gonna give you that's gonna give you more benefit <laughs> than thinking the dates are gonna be current in two months or a year. That's probably not gonna happen. If it does happen, it means Congress has acted and you'll be fine in E B three. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Rajesh. Uh, thanks for your question. We have a lot of callers. Maybe the, I'm requesting to everyone, please be, uh, your question is crispy, so that will be, we can get a chance to, everyone get a chance to. Already we are over the 710. So maybe next we go to the Rahul Metal, you can, you can ask a question. Last 6259. Okay, so uh, can you go for next uh, number five three zero four quadri? Yeah, sorry, I was unmuted. Uh, thank you very much for taking uh, the questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, movement in October. I actually have my priority date uh, with uh, my previous employer from uh, EP two June two thousand eleven. My current employer has just started uh, filing my payroll wages and uh, started my term process. So there is still time for my term to be filed. At least I'm looking at eight to ten months from here. So if the date moves uh, next month uh, to June 2011, can I file with my previous employer and simultaneously work on my term and I want to with my current employer? And in that scenario, if that my uh, date is not at the final action date till I get to a point where my current employer is filing my uh, 485. So in that case, how difficult is it to interfile or uh, change my 485? You know, that's a very good question, and it, there's a lot of you know thought that goes into this. So uh, another situation you might think about is, uh, you know, if I file, if my previous employer is going to support me, I don't have to go back and work for a previous employer. They can file with the Supplement J on EB2. My application is probably going to be pending for more than six months, okay? Which means my new employer doesn't have to go through and file the PERM or I-140 or anything else. What you can do is after the six months, you can port your pending application, and if you have the same or similar job, which you probably will, since you're porting your, your current employer's working on porting the date over anyway, uh, you would qualify to port over, and, and in the future, your current employer would only have to sign a new supplement J uh, as your priority date becomes uh, current with the final action dates. Oh. So, it makes so they don't have to uh, go through the process again? Well, so... You're in a, in a precarious situation now. So, I mean, if, I think, what is EB2 right now? May of 2011? It's May 15th. My priority date is June 10th. So, what happens, what happens if EB2 doesn't progress uh, to that? Okay, so you have the option now. Uh, maybe you can keep your current employer filing the perm and, and everything else. And once you get to I-140, maybe you file EB-3. Um, in case something happens in the future, you would have a, you know, your two petitions. But I mean, I would strongly suggest if you have the opportunity to file, uh, even if it's with, if the date does move next month or in two months, because your perm is going to take, you know, quite a bit of time, depending on where you're on the process to actually get certified. And once it's certified, then you would, you know, want to file your I-140, and if the dates were current, you could do, for filing, you could concurrently file, but, you know, it's just something you need to consider and kind of plan out, and uh, there's a lot of s specific circumstances that would impact your case, okay? Okay. Okay, so what are, what are the chances uh, that you think that uh, till my phone gets approved and uh, my current employer uh, is it okay to file with EB3? instead of EB2, as I heard that there are far less numbers in EB3 than compared to EB2. So what are the chances of 
me filing by say similar time next year uh, would the date would be current for EB3 or EB2 for June 2011. Well, you, you know, you're going off of what was what has happened in the past and what's happened in the past a lot of people between the 2008-2009 EB2s downgraded to EB3s because there weren't many EB3s filed and the, the final action dates were more current. Okay, so a lot of people did that. Uh, now, you have to think you're in a group of people where we're not even close to final action date yet. It's just filing dates. And there's going to be so many people also moving from EB2 to EB3 possibly that you know, it might be a wash. So what you need to consider probably is to see maybe by mid-month to see what the, the next uh, visa bulletin is going to uh, have published. If you're if it looks like your date's going to come current for EB2, go ahead and see if your current employer or your previous employer will file the EB2, right? Get that process started. Like I said, after six months, you can pour it over to your current employer or whoever else you want. Online, you're a bit. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. And what is that yep. looking called? Is there a form for it? Uh, 485 Supplement J is what you would do to at that point in time. But you're, uh, you're adjust you adjustment. Yeah. Uh, thanks for oh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much for your call. Yeah, we can take a next call and uh, you can see and uh, go for it. Next question. Hello? Yes. Hello? Hello. Hello. My name Hello. is Milan. Uh, the... Milan, yeah. Milan, go for it. Yeah, yeah, Milan. Yeah, yeah. I have a two questions. Uh, actually, I joined the very late, sorry for that. But my uh, priority date is March 24, 2013. Uh, and then my employer said he's going to do my uh, file amendment. Uh, so, at this, he's, he has shown me his lawyer, um, I-140, in the uh, page two, it says it's filing the amendment. So, if I do amendment, how the my EB, uh, EB2 is going to get affected? It shouldn't if be I, affected. They are taking the amendment. See, so what you want to, right. So, it shouldn't be affected. It, basically, what you're doing is you're, hmm. uh, it, what you need, I would need to know more specifics about what the actual job description was and what the uh, labor certification had to say to, to see what the, the thought would be for, for something like that, okay? Okay. But it is okay that he is clicking on amendment petition than the new one? Uh, it just depends. I'd have to know more details about your your background before I could really comment because there, there's probably a good reason for it. I just don't, I mean, I'd have to know more about like the underlying petition, what was filed before uh, to get into all that. Okay. Okay. Maybe Lucas, uh, Milan, maybe you can reach out, you can reach out to, reach out to Lucas offline. Did I have to file my, oh, just one question. Sorry for that. One question. Did I have to file my 944 for my wife also then? Uh, I can she, my own. So, each she application, right, so each application is going to require an I-944. I so, if your wife is filing also an adjustment of status application, she's going to also need to file the I-944. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Can it go for next uh, 0554, last four is it? Prashant uh, Biju. Okay. So, yeah, anyone I, I who... Yes. Yes, yes, I got that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, even so, maybe we are a little more, eight minutes more, seven. Maybe we can close by another 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Please ask Christy questions so that uh, everyone get a chance. So, we know that uh, our audience are very busy this week, this month. So, just make a sh short question and uh, get clarified. Thank you. Go for it. Yeah, Prashant, yeah, you can go for it. No, I, I, 
for five minutes in the conference call. We can close and then five minutes. If you have any questions, you can go for it. Anyone, anyone, if you have any questions, maybe you can ask to us. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Satya. Yes. 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 Yeah. So um, my question is about the uh, medical. Medical. Mm -hmm. um, do we really need to do uh, my priority date is in uh, December uh, twelfth, and I'm trying to. Hello. Yes, Satyan. Your question. I understand your question. Uh, Lucas explained a couple of times in this today. Uh, today's session. Uh, it's not required. Maybe you can go through the today interview in Facebook. This video will be Facebook and uh, YouTube. You will get the answer. Okay, great. Lucas so explained very, very detailed. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Sorry, I missed I uh, joined it late. So, how is the point with the foreign resident requirements? So, yes or no? I mean, that question, uh, I'm not very clear of what to answer. I'm, I'm sorry, the foreign residency requirements on um, um, which part? Have you complied with the foreign residence requirement? So that's on a sub, that's if you're, um, you don't need to answer that question unless you have a J visa. Okay, so right about okay. it, it'll say, have you been issued a J visa, right? That's like number 23 or 24 on the 45, right? Correct. So if it's if you have never had a J visa, a J one visa, then you don't need to answer that. So a J one visa requires under certain circumstances that you go. You, there's a home residency requirement where you have to return home for you know a year, um, and there's certain exceptions and waivers. But most of the people uh, right now qualifying under EB two or EB three won't have uh, ever had a J one visa. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Uh -huh. yeah, well, okay. Maybe uh, I don't know if I can ask another question. Uh, sure. If we are downgrading uh, from EB2 to EB3, um, I, I heard through my company attorney, you can just file a service request if EB2 becomes current. Is, is that uh, yeah, correct? So we kind of discussed this before. The only issue where this might come up, where there might be a scenario where it, it might not be permissible, is if um, the principal and derivative are swapping places, or maybe one of the principal or derivative wasn't listed on the other person's I-140. Uh, but yes, that is correct. If if it does, if a final action date becomes current, you can obviously make that request. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we can take another question from last four. Is it eight three four one? Do you have any question? The Florida is eight three four one. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Uh, I have a couple of questions on the Facebook page. The sure. Facebook page. So someone is asking to education evaluation. So is it required to take a education evaluation for applying for eighty five? No, the education evaluation would have uh, been required at the time of filing of the I-140. Okay, so if you're if you're downgrading again from EB2 to EB3, obviously you're going to need your education uh, and experience documents uh, at that time. But for 45 itself, if you have an approved I-140, um, there's no further uh, adjudication requirement for you know what your education background might be. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, one more question, um, Lucas, from Sharad Babu. If the applicant receives the health insurance tax credit through Obamacare, does it come under public benefit? You're going to need to answer. There's a part there that says, did you receive this under, you know, any type of provision? So, you're going to have to answer yes. Now, does this mean that that's going to make you ineligible to proceed for adjustment status? The answer is no. Okay, like I said before, as far as like your background, your arrest records, all that, you need to be honest and answer correctly. If you've ever been denied a visa, if you've ever been denied entry into the United States, all these you need to 
uh, honestly answer because um, if you don't, that could be, you know, a bigger problem than, than you know, using Obamacare benefits. So if, if that happened in the past, just uh, obviously answer the question truthfully, and then you can explain uh, if, the ne- if the need arises in the future when it comes to your uh, interview. Okay, yeah. That is a valid information and very good information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Today is a one and a half hour session. You've mm. given, uh, even though you are busy, I understand. Thanks for coming to the Radio, the platform, and uh, explaining each and every question very in detail. So you are giving enough time to everyone. Is a th- very thankful for you. So we can continue this show every Wednesday, Central Time, 6 p.m., Please be tuned to Telvina Radio Facebook Live and uh, you can connect to Director Lucas and you can get more information. It must ask for your scenarios. So we are trying to simplify in, in US, USCA immigration issues and uh, your scenarios. Thanks for joining the today call and uh, thanks for everyone for calling and uh, watching Telvina Radio Facebook. Please do like Telvina Radio Facebook and subscribe Telvina Radio. This this both this video will be available in both platform. You can go anytime and uh, you can see the, the entire the today's session. So you can get the more information if if anyone missed the the session from starting. So Lucas, uh, yeah, I'm going to be end session today. You can share apart from what we discussed today. Is anything left? Uh, if you want to share anything, you can share today. Closing session. Uh, again, uh, like what you mentioned, you know, for the current updates, it seems like every day that we uh, check our email or read the news, uh, something different comes up. So the best way to get accurate and resourceful information is to obviously follow and like NRA and tell you NRA radio. You can also yeah. follow and like my uh, Facebook page. I post uh, updates accordingly as, as we find uh, uh, the what information is, is uh, verified and valid. We'll share that information. And, um, you know, th- again, this is a great platform. Um, each person goes on an individual journey going from uh, F1, H1 to GC. And it, it's uh, at the end of the day, we have to remember that we're part of a community. This platform is here for this community. Um, we're trying to help answer and, and give the best uh, general advice we can. Now, it, for any specific uh, scenario that wasn't covered or is too detailed to maybe be appropriate for this forum, you feel free to email me or contact NRA Radio. And we'll try and address that offline. And, uh, you know, again, we're here for the benefit of the community and, and to make sure everyone feels comfortable moving forward with this process. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas. And uh, before before going, just the last question the Gaur- from Gaur- Ar- uh, Arora. This question is how long it will do downgrade and get the EAD advanced payroll one filed up before end of this month? So Good you already question. explained. It. Yeah, you already explained. Maybe you can explain again. So when you downgrade, you're going to be filing concurrently your I-140 and your adjustment EAD advanced parole. Uh, as soon as the application is accepted, that might take five or six weeks to get receipts or to see that your check or money orders or whatever it is uh, has been processed. Now, I, I do want to recommend whoever is filing, even if you're filing your own, use a check or the best practice is to use money order. Uh, you don't want to use the options there to file with a credit card. Uh, if, if for some reason the transaction doesn't go through, they're not going to try again. They're not going to contact you to say, hey, we have a problem. Uh, they're just going to send you back your packet. And if the dates move, you're going to miss an opportunity. So use money order or check, personal check if you have to. Um, and then once you get the receipt, it's going to be probably another six or seven months. Uh, you will get a biometrics appointment similar to H4AD. We'll go get your biometrics taken, uh, and then hopefully, you know, not soon, not too long after that, you'll get your uh, card in the mail. Uh, but again, remember, everyone, we need to make sure ca- packages are complete, that they're properly uh, 
you know, documented and that we have the proper filing fees uh, included with that package, okay? Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for, for the last question. So, yeah, we will depend. If, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Lucas anytime. Info at rate uh, bgimmblog.com. Maybe you can, you can visit the Facebook and uh, website. So, we are ready to help to the community. If you have any topic, if you have any questions, post uh, your question and Facebook page. We are ready to help you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, joining today. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas, joining today. Uh, signing off, Vinkar.